So my name is Dr. Winston Guathme from the University of Virginia, and I'm here to speak about hip label reconstruction. These are my disclosures. So it's important to know about the hip labral anatomy in order to understand how to fix it and how to reconstruct it. It's a ring of fiber cartilage attached to the acetabular rim, and it ranges from 48 millimeters in size, a lot of morphological variations. Uh, it's continuous to the articular surface. It's got a very dense proprioceptive fibers and also dense pain fiber uh, elements within it. Um, the function, it distributes the load and helps to increase the acetabular volume, but also seals the joint. This is really important you're trying to treat labral tears because you want to recreate that labral seal so that you can pressurize your interarticular fluid and maintain the normal function of the labrum. As you can see in this video here that Sanji and Badi have put together, a normal labrum creates excellent negative pressure and seals the joint and makes it so very hard to distract. In the case we have labral deficiency, what you can see is the labrum no longer creates that seal and there's really no stability to that joint. So the labrum is also a very potent pain generator. As you can see in a torn labrum, it can be a quite uh, a source of pain for people with hip problems. So the goals of labral treatment, we wanna stabilize, remove any loose tissue, restore the anatomy, improve the pain. We also wanna eradicate the underlying cause of any labral damage, as you can see here. So there's no question in 2024, labral repair continues to be the standard of care. It certainly performs better than debridement. It's got superior outcomes uh, to resection and debridement, high rates of healing, and high rates of, re of return to play activity. Excellent long-term outcomes. There's plenty of literature that suggests that labral repair and the right patients do very well. But what do you do when you see this? There, here is this is the kind of the whole crux of my of my talk right now. Because sometimes a labrum, no matter how bad you want to fix it, is not fixable. So I like this Mike Tyson quote where he says, "Everybody has a plan until he gets punched in the face." And this when you see this intraoperatively can be quite a can can be quite a source of pain for the surgeon. So this is in, introducing labral reconstruction. So the concept of labral reconstruction is you remove all or part of the labrum and replace it with a graft. As far as the advantage of a repair, you basically don't have to worry about the, the labral tissue. You, you render the labral tissue inconsequential because you're going to replace all of it. You can improve the labral seal. You can remove the pain fibers, and you can also uh, comprehensively correct the rim. Some of the barriers utilization, though, is very difficult to execute a labral reconstruction. It costs more a lot of time as well as uh, costs more um, as far as the overall cost of the procedure. It also needs a skilled assistant. There's different types. We do segmental types, circumferential or complete, and also labral augmentations. So as you go through each one of them, a segmental labral reconstruction is when you're replacing just a portion of the labrum. Uh, advantages here, you're, you're removing the painful fibers uh, at, the, uh, at the tear site. You're sparing the native labrum in most of the area of the hip. It's definitely technically easier, shorter traction times. Disadvantage though is that you have to have these nastimoses at either end. You have discontinuity of the circumferential fibers and you can compromise the seal. The circumferential labrum reconstruction, you're basically taking the entire labrum out and replacing the entire labrum with a graft. As far as the advantages, this does remove all the painful labral fibers. You have a continuous graft with no side-to-side -side anastomoses, so you don't have to worry too much about how you restore the seal because you can really restore the seal uh, quite anatomically by restoring the entire uh, anatomy of the circumferential fibers. And any excess graft can be excised. As far as disadvantages, this is much more challenging than segmental reconstruction, and you have to use many anchors, and suture management can be a big pain in, uh, in these scenarios. Augmentation has also been introduced as a uh, potential to, to restore the native labrum, but add graft on top of it. And basically what you're doing here, you're maintaining the chondral labral anatomy. You're, there's no side-to-side -side anastomoses. You're basically just bolstering that native labrum with additional graft material. As far as disadvantages, you do leave behind some painful, uh, the potential for pain fibers to remain, and the, the seal might not be as good as you'd like for it to be. But you can see the labral reconstruction can certainly restore functional anatomy, no question. So as far as how it does in the literature, uh, it has, is, there's very good long-term outcome studies now showing that labral reconstruction does quite well. When do I have a graft available? In these scenarios, hyperplastic labrums, ossified labrums, irreparable labrums, and failed repairs, I think it's important to go into those cases with the potential to reconstruct. Uh, again, it's always possible that in many cases you're able to repair the native labrum, and that's always, I think, in my mind, uh, uh, pr preferential over reconstructing the labrum. But you don't want to be in a scenario like this where you walk into a hip like this, you don't have a graft available. So steps of label reconstruction. I start with access and diagnostic arthroscopy. It's important to really analyze what you're up against, evaluate the labral tissue, and see what needs to be done. Secondly, you remove the entire labrum and prep the rim. 
For me, I like to go to the femoroplasty next. And so what I'll do is I'll release traction, put the ball back into the socket and do the entire uh, femoral work before I do any sort of labor work. I think it's important to do this because one, uh, you have access to the entire peripheral compartment and two, you won't compromise your graft. Now, during this process, we prepare the graft as well. So if I'm going to be performing a labor reconstruction, at some point, I take the hip out of traction and I walk to the back table and I start preparing my labor reconstruction. As far as anchors go, I'll place those anchors back in with the hip in traction. I'll place anchors entirely around the rim. Then we pass the graft and then we fix the graft sequentially from front to back. And finally, we close the capsule. As far as considerations for the graft, I think it's one of the most important things about labor reconstruction for success. So preparing a well-fashioned graft that handles well inside the joint, I think is critical for the overall success of the surgery. So I'll aim for a, a graft. I usually, I, I tend to do circumferential labor reconstructions and I'll aim for a 12 centimeter graft in length because that normally is gonna suffice for the amount of labor that I'm replacing. I look for a diameter about five to six uh, millimeters. And I'll whip stitch the entire graft in order to maintain its integrity and allow me to handle it from the joint. So as far as options go, there's many different options you can use. Dr. Philippon introduced this concept using fasciolata autograft. Um, and now you can also use fasciolata allograft, which is my preferred graft. Additionally, if you need, you have a hamstring allograft or tibialis anterior perineus longus allograft as well. So why do I like fasciolata allograft? I think it's very predictable. Um, it's uniform in its thickness consistency, and I'm able to basically create exactly the size graft that I need in order to uh, perform the procedure. It handles very well inside the joint. It doesn't swell nearly as much as some of the tendon grafts. I find that if I handle a, a, a semitendinosus allograft inside the joint for a period of time, it tends to swell and lose some of its form. There's also very good outcome data. Brian White and Andy Wolf have put together some very nice papers showing how durable the fasciolata allograft is as far as providing good patient outcomes. Some of the disadvantages to it, which I think is germane to this conversation, it takes skill and time to put this together. I usually prepare this graft myself. In order to do so, you actually have to spend a lot of time folding this graft and tubularizing it and whip stitching it. So this is what the graft prep looks like. So again, this takes me about 20 to 25 minutes to do. You fold the graft basically to create exactly the size you're looking for. Then you tubularize it and whip stitch it from one end to the other. And over time, you basically create a, a tubularized graft that ends up being about 12 centimeters in, this, in its overall length and about six millimeters in diameter. Again, in my hands, it takes somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes. Um, I, I do not have a PA who helps me to fashion my graft, so I fashion all the graphs myself. And so that's 20 to 25 minutes of downtime in the operating room. So traction time is like tourniquet time. Uh, if you're a, a knee or shoulder or a knee or uh, upper extremity surgeon who uses a tourniquet, you know that the more time you're on, under tourniquet, the higher the complication risk might be. Same thing goes for traction in the hip, um, especially when people uh, surgeons use perineal posts. You're actually, uh, you know, if you're applying traction over a longer period of time, you expose that patient to additional problems. And also anecdotally, I feel like patients who are under surgery for longer periods of time have more pain when they wake up. Um, and also time is money. Um, remember that the operating room is, uh, is, a, is a resource that hospital, hospitals bill for. And um, on average, you know, the hospital OR time can be anywhere upwards of $30, $35 uh, per minute. And so if you're taking 20 minutes to prep a graft, that's basically $740 in OR time. I think about that the movie uh, Interstellar where they're on the, the, the planet where one hour is equal to seven years on Earth. Sometimes that's what it feels like when you're in the operating room trying to prepare one of these graphs. So uh, Allosaurus uh, introduced an off-the-shelf fasciolata allograft, and this really, I think, came, uh, came to be because of surgeons who were frustrated with the process of preparing a graft for labor reconstructions. And so I think uh, this graft ends up being a really helpful thing because in order to perform a labor reconstruction, it, it takes away that element that's so problematic, at least for me, and that is the downtime in the operating room when you're, when you're prepping this graft. So uh, it's whip stitch fasciolata, so basically the same graft I like to use anyways, and it's been whip stitched uh, in, in the lab um, to three different lengths. There's a 60 millimeter length, a 100 millimeter length, and a 140 millimeter length with two separate diameters, basically a small and a large, um, which are about the size I like to have for my grafts anyways. And the, one of the nice things about this graft is the end segments can actually be, be cut to length. So if you if you have a, a defect that's not quite fits to the size that uh, comes out of the box, you can cut down on the end of the graft to make it smaller in order to fit the defect. So what is the right length? Uh, this is a nice study that Mike Salata and some others did as far as trying to understand what the size of the acetabular rim is. 
And looking at this, what you'll see is the entire acetabular rim in adult male is about 15.8 millimeters. In general, when we're using a segmental, it's usually going to be somewhere between three and six centimeters uh, in order to uh, fill that defect. What I would call a partial circumferential, which is a, a type that I like to use a lot where I place the graft low in the front and take it around the back into nor normal labrum, somewhere between eight centimeters will do the trick here. Or a full circumferential, basically that TAL, the TAL graft, where you're placing your first anchor at the five o'clock position, your last anchor at the seven o'clock position, that graft is up to 14 centimeters in length. So I think that these three lengths are perfect as far as trying to fill the defect. And if you are in a case and you understand what the size of your defect is, you can select the right graft for the, for the job. So I did uh, my first Ace Connects label reconstruction in November 2023. There's the team from Alice Horse who actually came to, to see it in, in, in person, including the person who actually stitched the graft. Um, and it went really quite well. So this is actually, this is a video showing the very first case I used the Ace Connects graft in. And this is a 25-year-old female who has a hypoplastic labrum. So as you're probing this labrum, what you're realizing, there's just basically no labral bulk whatsoever. And my concern in fixing this labrum is I, as I start to fix this primarily, I'm not going to have much labral tissue to work with. As I start peeling the labrum off the rim, I also realize this labrum is just, it just doesn't have a lot of, of uh, there's some ossification within it. And there's not a lot of label compliance to it. So again, I worry that by, that by uh, using this labrum for my primary repair, it would be insufficient to create the seal. So here we've taken out the entire native labrum. We address the femoral, the femoral side as, as described previously in my technique. And what we let do here is, is, I think one of the most important things in all hip arthroscopy is addressing the, uh, the FAI. You know, you can do whatever you want to with the labrum, but if you don't do a good job addressing the FAI, you're just not gonna get a good outcome. And so I'll spend a lot of time on the femur, making sure the femoral, the femoral side is perfectly round. And as you can see there, there's just nothing inside that joint sealing the hip. So uh, this, this hip needs a labrum. So we'll start placing your anchors around the rim and you wanna place your anchors as close as you possibly can to the articular surface so that when the new labrum comes in, it restores that anatomical seal of the joint. So really critical you place these anchors as close as you can to the articular surface. So you use several portals in order to do this. Now, this is what's so nice about this graft. One, I didn't need to prepare the graft. It's probably the most important thing, but two, it handles really well inside the joint. Uh, it's whip stitched in a way that as you as you manipulate it using this uh, um, you know graspers and whatnot, it becomes it really doesn't lose any of its direct integrity. And you're able to position it up onto the rim and place and tension each anchor appropriately, and the labor maintains uh, its uh, its appearance. And again, I think half the half the battle and and labor reconstruction is is reforming that perfect uh, seal and also the aesthetics of your all over of the overall reconstruction. So here we are fixing it in the back, and once we're done. What you'll see is you have a, a pretty nicely shaped labrum going all the way from the TAL in the front. In this case, I went about halfway down the back. So there's a 10 centimeter graft that we use the entirety of, um, able to fix it in the front, secure it with anchors all around the, the entire uh, rim and all the way down the back. It creates a nice anastomosis in the back and you can restore the labral seal here. So this is my technique, how I do uh, a label reconstruction, at least this partial circumferential. And what you can see is once you drop the ball back into the socket, you're able to completely reestablish the seal. So um, as we um, continue to, to, to basically evaluate the labrum and make sure that it's all secured to the rim, as we place the ball back into the socket, what you can see is you have an excellent labral seal. You can see the egress of the interarticular fluid, meaning that you've basically expressed all that fluid. And as we apply traction to this, you can see that it actually creates a pretty nice suction against the actual head of the femur. So this to me is uh, is better than what this patient could have had had we not replaced the labrum using a, using a graft. And again, and again, capsular management is always important. I like to close a capsule at the end, make sure we have a nice prototype closure. So as far as my experience with the Ace Connex, um, I've, I've, I've uh, used three times now. Um, all three times I did the 10 centimeter uh, version of the graft, basically placed as low as I could in the front and took it about halfway down the back. It saved about average of 22 minutes of OR time. And one thing I really like about it is I don't have to stress about the graft. I can focus on my FEI correction, which to me is one of the most critical things to any FEI case is making sure you get the correction correct. Um, the graft again handles very nicely inside the joint. The way that it's whip stitched, it means that I can manipulate it inside the joint and does not lose its structural integrity. It's nice to have the adjustable length. I've had a couple of scenarios where uh, the graft, you know, was a little bit too long when I put it in. I'm able to cut the back off in order to uh, make sure that the anastomosis is perfect in the back. And again, I think the aesthetics of this graft is really nice. It looks like a it looks like a normal labrum. In fact, uh, you know, this I think this the the, the actual appearance of this once you recreate the seal um, looks very good. 
And also, the, I've had my first patient, I did again back in the first of November, has had an excellent outcome. This is actually a note she sent me. You know, thank you for believing me. She, her BAS score has gone from eight to one. She rates her hip as near normal. And in fact, the same patient, I did a labor reconstruction on the opposite side using a more conventional technique, which took a little bit longer in the operating room. And she thinks her initial postoperative pain and overall recovery has actually been faster from this side. So ended up with a card and a bottle of scotch. So that's pretty good for me. So as far as in summary, uh, as far as what I think about these labor reconstruction graphs, uh, I think it's going to be an, an essential tool no matter what. I think anybody who performs hip arthroscopy can have to be able to do this as part of their practice in order to address those types of scenarios I outlined before. Um, this graph is very helpful to streamline the procedure. Again, it takes away so much stress in the operating room because you're able to focus on other parts of the procedure. You don't have the patient sitting there in traction with nothing going on. You don't require a skilled assistant. Again, it obviates the need for a skilled assistant to prep, to prep the graft. Again, shorter OR time, I think, leads to less pain. Uh, shorter OR time leads to reduced cost. And the graft handles very well and looks great once you're done. So that's uh, that's my approach to labor reconstruction using the ACE Connex graft. I'm happy to answer any questions.